my name is Daniel G. Um, first of all, thank you for coming out here. I'm a big fan, and uh, I really enjoy your talk. Thank you. The LTB, and it's really inspiring. So thank you. Well, my question is, um, I'm running the uh, Blockchain for Good Society meetup here in Korea, for a community where the Blockchain for Good Society. Yes. And uh, we we are a community of people that believe that blockchain is a very useful tool that can solve the social problems that exist today. Okay. And it's uh, it's a really uh, it gives impact and improves lives of the 99% of the world. And we've been discussing about how um, um, blockchain and Bitcoin has enabled the uh, women's rights in, in Afghanistan. And we've been talking about how the UN and the WFP... Is there a question? Let's get to the question. Yes, um, Very good. I was, I was uh, wondering if you could share your thoughts or ex your experience, any cases that you've seen that um, you've seen that blockchain technology have improved and impacted these lives because we're running out of use cases to share. Uh, th there aren't that many. Uh, we have to be realistic about that. There are a few great examples. You know, the um, the projects they did where they were paying women in Afghanistan to do coding and get paid in crypto. Yes, it's a great story. It didn't last very long. And part of the reason it didn't last very long is because it was very difficult to introduce that level of technology into that society. Um, and of course, if this if this kind of thing is working well, then you won't hear about it. Think about it this way: it, it, Let's say I'm a 13-year-old Saudi woman who is about to get married to a 55-year-old man, and I want to get the hell out of that country as quickly as possible to avoid that future. <laughs> um, so then I've managed to escape through the help of organizations and friends, etc., who smuggle money into the country using Bitcoin, and then I escape. The first thing I do after I escape is hold a press conference to tell everyone how Bitcoin did it. Um, no, that's going to cause some problems for everybody involved in that situation. So everybody's going to keep very quiet about it. I know of ser several cases of uh, people who are leaving Venezuela, for example, using Bitcoin to escape. Uh, one of my good friends uh, hires software developers in Venezuela. And um, after three or four months, he has to find new software developers because the previous ones who he paid in Bitcoin use that Bitcoin to get themselves and 30 to 50 members of their family out of the country. <laughs> and then he has to find new ones, and then they get out of the country, and then he has to find new ones, and they get out of the country. And they estimate they've gotten more than 300 people out of Venezuela just by paying people in Bitcoin to do coding which is amazing. Um, but they're not going to go publicize that more broadly. right? We're not going to give you specific examples, because that doesn't work. Bottom line is, that's what neutral means. right? That's what these principles of neutrality mean. The fact that someone who is legally prohibited from owning money or property... right? So There are probably about a dozen countries in the world where women are prohibited from owning property and owning bank accounts. And the reason for that is because in those countries women are property. And so they property can't own property, right? They're all owned by their husbands. Well actually no, they're owned by their fathers. And then they're transferred in a sale called marriage to their husband. Um, so in those kinds of situations, the neutrality principle where the blockchain doesn't care um, creates a situation where uh, people can own money, uh, even when they're prohibited from owning money. The other thing that you have to be really careful about this, in general, when we have these conversations, we have to realize that what we're talking about is illegal. Right? What we're talking about is illegal. There. Maybe not here. Uh, I believe women in Korea are allowed to own money. Yes, very good. Um, so here it's not. There it is, and, and that's why you have to make a very important personal choice, which is to make the very serious distinction between illegal and immoral. There are many things in life that are illegal and moral, not just moral obligations of morality that we have. And there are many things in life that are legal and are absolutely immoral. Right? So, um, selling cluster bombs to the Saudis, legal, profitable, 
in fact, highly celebrated and listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Moral? You decide. So there's this very diff big difference between legality and morality. Morality is a personal thing. Morality is how you decide what is right and wrong. Legality is what society, one society, not all societies, because each one has different laws, decides what is right and wrong. And sometimes it's society that is wrong, and moral people oppose that. I have absolutely no problem with breaking the law when it comes to blockchain. I think we have a moral obligation to break the law when it comes to using blockchains. Not all laws, some laws, the immoral ones. Right? So make that important distinction. And sometimes it's better not to talk about these use cases. Sometimes it's better to build them rather than advertise them. Gareth asks about Bitcoin adoption outside of the first world economies. Hi, Andreas. I know from listening to your talks that you spend a lot of your time traveling to parts of the world that could really benefit from Bitcoin to address problems like a lack of access to banking or having an escape option from currencies with high inflation. In your experience talking to people in places like Argentina and listening to what they have to say, what are the key problems to adoption? And do you see progress being made to address these problems? For instance, is it a lack of fiat on-ramps? Is, is local Bitcoin still the only route into crypto for most people? Is it a lack of knowledge of Bitcoin? Or a combination of all of these things and more? It's a combination of all of these things and more. Uh, a lot of it has to do with building basic infrastructure. So building wallets that are easy to use and easy to use securely and easy to use when uh, fees are high and easy to use when fees are low and that use the different new technologies that exist in each uh, blockchain to enable um, you know features that are powerful whether that's replaced by fee and child pays for parents type fee management techniques or it's native segwit addresses or it's lightning wallets and payment channels and things like that it's infrastructure for exchanging uh, ATMs um, as well as exchanges, but also local meetups, community building organizations, and opportunities to meet other people face to face. You know, local bitcoins is is great. It's not the only way you can meet people uh, who are willing to buy and sell uh, crypto. And there's a lot of ways to do over the counter transactions. It's about education and knowledge of Bitcoin, especially in other languages. So you know, one of the efforts I've been involved in is getting as much of the knowledge in this space translated into Spanish. For example, the subtitles to my videos. And these efforts are important because you know, it's not surprising, but a lot of the documentation, a lot of the articles, a lot of the applications are still only in English. And if you're trying to do work in developing economies, you need to address other languages. Spanish being the biggest one, of course, but then uh, also uh, French and other local languages.